In this episode of Mind Pump, we cover a very important topic. We talk about pain. Um, now, a lot of you listening may have some form of chronic nagging pain. We know how big of an issue that can be. It definitely reduces a person's quality of life. At the very least, it can get in the way of your progress. Uh, if you're trying to improve your strength uh, or burn body fat or sculpt your body or build muscle, you know, knee pain, back pain, hip pain, wrist pain, um, any kind of pain can really slow things down. Sometimes it can stop or reverse progress. So in this episode, we cover the five most important factors that we've experience working with clients for over two decades that really works on chronic pain. So we talk about mobility, of course, everything about mobility. That's the most important thing. Talk about diet. Believe it or not, diet can play a big role in how much pain you're feeling. We talk about sleep, sunlight, and then we even mention mindfulness. Now, before the episode gets going, I want to remind everybody that MAPS Performance is 50% off. Now, MAPS Performance is actually one of our best mobility workout programs. Actually, in fact, Mass Performance includes mobility sessions as part of your workouts. Mobility sessions work on your ability to move through full ranges of motion, which then, of course, alleviates or gets rid of or even prevents pain. But Mass Performance also improves overall athletic performance. It's an athletic type workout. So you are using weights in the gym, but it's different from your traditional workouts. It's excellent for fat loss, performance, and muscle building. Again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsgreen.com and use the code GREEN50, G-R-E-E-N-5-0, no space for the discount. Dude, you guys want to hear a crazy statistic? I love crazy statistics. So I was doing, um, I was writing some some content for the for the website. and uh, hey, You ripped a ton of blogs this weekend, didn't you? Uh, let, well, from, from last week to the weekend, I wrote about eight. Um, so, uh, but one of the articles I wrote was about pain. Uh, you know, uh, our marketing team wanted me to write something about how to alleviate back pain in particular. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking up statistics and I didn't realize it was this bad. Uh, over, it's estimated that over 100 million Americans suffer from chronic pain daily. Wow. Every single day. So that's, all, that's like one-fourth, one out of every four, one out of every three Americans. So take 10 people, and the odds are three of them suffer from some form of chronic pain on a, on a daily basis. You should describe uh, chronic and acute pain because I know it may seem simple, but there's a lot of people that don't know the difference between the two of them. No, that's, I'm glad you said that. Um, acute pain is, is when you hurt yourself. Like a serious injury, yeah. broken, yeah, so broken bone, torn muscle, some kind of trauma, strained yeah. ligaments. Yeah, something. like like if you hurt if you're hurt right now, if your knee hurts right now, and I ask you, hey, what happened to your knee? And you say, oh, I, I twisted it last week. You know, I was water skiing or whatever. That's an acute. That's it. That's it. That's from an injury. That's acute pain. Chronic pain is the kind of pain where if I were to ask you, why does your knee hurt? And you went, well, I don't know. It just kind of bothers me. I got bad knees. Yeah, 10 years ago I heard yeah. it, and then it's never been the same since. Or I just have bad knees. I got to, you know, every time when I wake up, they're stiff or whatever. That's chronic pain. And th there's a the reason why that's important to dis differentiate is because they both have different ways of, uh, of, of fixing them. Yeah, Okay. different the, treatment. Yeah, like m most of the way you fix acute pain is rest. Like you... You tore something, you twisted a ligament, uh, you broke a bone or whatever. Right. Extreme rest. case, you need surgery yeah, or something exactly. like that. Yeah, exactly. Like sit back, rest, like don't do anything. Chronic pain is not like that. In fact, most chronic pain today is very different today than it was 50 or 100 years ago. Chronic pain in the past usually was a uh, result of overuse. So like if someone had back pain, you know, my, my, my dad's generation, my grandfather's generation, when they had back pain, a lot of it was because oh you're well you're doing eight hours of or ten hours of hard labor all day long. Today it's the result of inactivity. Mm -hmm. A lot of chronic pain comes from the fact that we're just not moving enough. Um, we're, we're sitting down all day long. Uh, most gosh, I, I don't know what these statistics are. I haven't looked them up for a long time, but majority of Americans now um, sit most of the day. And there's not necessarily inherently anything wrong with sitting, but if, if you do one thing all the time, your body actually starts to form into whatever you do because it becomes good at it. And when you become really, really good at sitting, you become bad at almost everything else. Well, I remember reading a, a statistic not that long ago that said if you do an hour of vigorous exercise every day, 
you're still considered sedentary. Totally. Mm -hmm. That's how little we're moving now that, and that to me is very eye-opening because if you ask the average person that makes effort to get to the drive to the gym, go there, get their hard one hour workout or whatever, and then go back to work or go home. And you ask them, Hey, would you consider yourself an active person? And they would say, yeah, I work out every day. Mm. Uh, but w our jobs today are so different to your point, Sal, than, uh, what, you know, what they were 50 and a hundred years ago that a lot of what we do, including ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, sit down at desk or sit down in chairs and are on computers or talking or doing something like this, that, you know, even if you get up for an hour and you work out really hard, you're still considered a sedentary person. And I think a lot of that has caused a lot of this chronic pain. And I remember as a trainer, this used to be like the number one thing that I ha I used to have to combat with pe with people. They would tell me, um, "Oh, my back! I have a bad back. I have a you know bad knees. I have bad shoulders." And I'd ask that the follow up question, "What did you do?" And more often than not, it was just, "Oh, I'm getting old." And they would yeah. say, "You'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You'll mm -hmm. see, son. When you get this age, that you know this is just it's part of getting older." And uh, you know, it was such a hard thing for me to overcome when you're 28 years old, 25 years old, and you're and you're training these clients that are in their 40s and 50s, and they're telling you that, um, you know, no matter how much I try to explain to them that it has to do with their their movement or lack of movement or or their bad movement that's causing this chronic pain, you know, they would just look back at you and just kind of like scoff and be like, oh, it's because well, you're, yeah. you're young. No, no, the movement hurts. Like, yeah. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it's it's asking somebody to then do something that is even more uncomfortable, but it will, you know, provide that sort of medicine and therapy that they need. Like they need to move and express this movement. Well, no, I'm glad you said that, Justin, because it's it, it, movement is definitely generally part of a lot of times how you solve chronic pain, but it's got to be the right kind of movement, Absolutely. right? Because- a lot of people will say, well, I do try to walk, but then my ankles hurt or my knees hurt a lot. And so I, what a lot of people don't realize is it has to do with how you're moving, uh, has a lot to do with why you're in pain. Not just the fact that you're not moving, but then when you try to move, mm -hmm. it's how you move. Well, if we were to, if we were to narrow it down to the, the five most Im important things that you should do to help relieve chronic pain, how would you guys list those? No, and mm -hmm. we, we should definitely break it all, all that down. I, I, mean, I remember as a trainer... When I first became a trainer, thinking that the most value that I would bring my clients was uh, weight loss, I thought for sure that would be the most valuable thing. All mm -hmm. oh, right, it was it was not at all. Um, it was getting people to not have pain. If you're a trainer listening right now and you want to be a valuable trainer, that's where you should place your energy. I tell you what, you get someone to lose thirty pounds, that's great. They're gonna love you. You get someone's shoulder to stop hurting that's been bothering them for 10 or 15 years. You got them for life. You're a god. Yeah. Um, and Especially and, if it was limiting them from doing things that they love. And, and you know what? It's funny. You get into this, these patterns where you you just start to mold your life around your pain. And then when it goes away, you realize how much you weren't doing. Like, whoa, I, I didn't realize getting out of bed, I had to move so slowly. Now that the pain's gone, I can get out of bed. And I feel like I can just bounce up and it's down. It's funny because I remember distinctively like being a trainer that was trying to solve weight issues and trying to to create, you know, like opportunities for them to like gain muscle and all that. But then I transitioned into somebody that was like more concerned with like proper movement and alleviating pain. My business exploded. Totally. And it was it was so eye opening that that again, to those statistics that you brought up in the beginning, like that's the majority of people you're gonna see. Like we need to learn how to, you know, alleviate and, and solve these issues for these. People. It is, and if you're, if you're, uh, if you have bad movement patterns, you have pain, you're not able to work out the way you want to. You're not able to build the kind of muscle that you want to build, which means you can't burn body fat like you want to, like you want to burn. Your quality of life is reduced. You're limited in terms of your activity, uh, what you can do, when you can do it. Um, so this is a big, this is a very important subject for everybody, even mm -hmm. if you don't have pain. You have to, it's, it's important to consider it now so that you don't get it in the future. And here's the other thing that I learned uh, in the back half of my career. When you hurt, that's one of the, that's like, there's a lot of signals that lead up to that, by the way. Right before that. Yeah. So it's not that's like, it's like the final one, your body's screaming at you. That's dude. right. It's that's like, you've right. been ignoring me You're for the last listening. year, two years, five years. This is me finally saying, fuck you. Right. Fix yeah. me. Right, right, right. Absolutely. So let's, let's break it down. Now, the obvious one for me, um, uh, and I think probably for you guys is to, improve mobility. That's got to be the most obvious number one thing that I, that you go to when you're trying to uh, yeah. fix your, your pain problems. Yeah. Now, 
that and that covers a variety of different techniques that uh, we should probably go into. With mobility is I, I like that as a general sort of overarching uh, sort of topic because you have you know static stretching in there, you have dynamic stretching in there, you have like SMR kind of techniques where you're like working with soft tissue, you have uh, you, you know all, all these other like sort of ways of, of pr promoting better movement that we need to cover. Totally, and so, posture, right? You're posture, that exactly. Too. Totally, yeah. So um, mobility is your ability to move. Move through, uh, you know, full ranges of motion with total con control and stability. So that's what mobility is. So what are the components that allow you to move into full ranges of motion with control and stability? Well, first off, you have to have the flexibility to even just get there, right? So if you can't even get, like, if you think about extending your arms straight up above your head and what's preventing you from doing that are muscles that are too tight. So you're pushing, but you can't really straighten it out because there's muscles that are pulling down. They're too tight. Lack of flexibility there is causing problems with mobility. And that's also what's probably causing the chronic pain. Totally. Because the body is supposed to work together like that. And that this is where why mobility is so important is when you start to lose the mobility and you want to still perform certain movements, the body starts to overcompensate in other areas. And that's where a lot of this chronic pain comes from is the inability for a joint to move through its fullest range of motion like it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. And then you ask your body to do a movement and it, there's a certain pattern it should do. But because we have poor mechanics, poor mobility, the body still tries to do that movement, but then it overcompensates from other areas. And this is what normally causes this. There's a preferred position that your your body wants to place your, your bones in your joints. Like that's, there, there is an optimal place, uh, you know, where it wants to be. Uh, to be able to move uh, accordingly and, and to be able to, uh, you know, address that and, and to get uh, access to that again is is crucial. It's paramount. That's why posture is something like we need to consider right away. Yeah. So when you're, when you're moving, your body does a very good job of, you know, Adam used the word compensate. Your body figures out the best, easiest way for your particular body to move. So let's say you're walking. Let's say you're just doing a walk, right? And let's say you 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 have a torn calf muscle, um, or an underdeveloped calf muscle. Oh, let's use say my, my Achilles right. example so is a perfect example. Of what happens? Right. right. So let's say something there, right? Like there's there's bad neuromuscular connection to the calf. Something something's wrong with your calf, and maybe you were born that way. Your body will learn how to get you to walk best with that weak calf. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a a part of our body's uh, it's this wonderful evolution where we can continue to move. Now, here's the problem. There's an optimal way to move, and then there's suboptimal ways to move. So just because my body figured out a way to get me to walk, even with an underdeveloped or disconnected calf, doesn't mean that now other parts of my body aren't going to have to work in suboptimal ways, and I can start to cause problems. And there's this chain effect where mm -hmm. problems down on my ankles can start to affect my knee, which then can affect my hip, which then can actually affect my shoulder and uh, my head. So there are optimal ways to move, and that's what mobility is all about. It's, it's figuring out how to get your body to move optimally, and there's different ways of doing this. One of them, the most basic one, which is what I, I mentioned earlier, which is stretching. Stretching improves or increases the range of motion. Now, you don't have ownership over that range of motion when you stretch. doesn't mean that just because now I can touch my toes and I couldn't before that it's safe for me to do stuff in that stretched toe touch position. It just means now I have that range of motion. So now that I have that range of motion, I want to connect mm -hmm. to that range of motion. And that's where strengthening comes in. Strength is a very important part of mobility. If you get like a somebody's like Gumby, who's like hyper flexible and, and just everything's loose and you think, oh, that person must have no pain. Actually not true. Some of the most some of the people who suffer from the most pain are weak, hyper mobile uh, individuals, people with hyper flexibility. Well, this is why certain types of yoga is just not enough either. I mean, if you're doing a uh, certain yoga classes where you are not actively stretching and you're just kind of lying there in positions and, and holding, holding positions for a long time, and you're increasing range of motion and flexibility, but you don't have strength in that new range of motion, it's not as beneficial as somebody who is working on mobility or staying active mm. throughout that. Well, range. there's a massive difference between that active and passive uh, flexibility, and and that's something that was. I mean, it's very enlightening when you have somebody else or a coach 
to be able to take your joints through, you know, even further range than you even knew you had the, the capacity to do. And, uh, it just so, sort of proves the point that like, there's more uh, progress to be had in terms of like, now I can connect to that part of it and, and build strength in that direction. So if I get in a situation where I'm moving and I'm in that position, I'm less likely to be hurt. Yeah. Now I like static stretching for immediate pain relief. It's actually one of my favorite techniques to get someone to feel better right now. Now it doesn't produce permanent pain relief, but let's just say you your your lower back um, is tight uh, and it hurts and it's kind of chronically uh, sore. Um, and let's say part of the reason why your lower back is in pain is because you have these really, really tight hamstrings that limit your your pelvis from moving the way you want. If I took you through some static hamstring stretches, so like an example of that would be you know, you'd lay on your back and I'd lift one leg up and hold the other one down and stretch your hamstring. Or you could do this on your own. You could lay on your back, grab a belt, put it around your foot, kind of straighten your leg out and pull it back and hold that stretch. What the static stretch does is it sends a signal to the central nervous system that says, hey, let's, let's let this muscle chill out a little bit. We don't have to be so tight and so tense. Now, immediately what you'll notice is some pain relief. Like you'll stand up and be like, whoa, I feel less pain because now those muscles aren't so tight. They're not pulling on the pelvis as much, which, which was causing the back pain. Same thing with the hip. Like if you have sciatica pain, for example, a real easy cross leg stretch where you're sitting up real tall across your leg, place one foot on your knee, bend forward, hold that stretch, immediate pain relief. But that's not enough. <clears throat> we need to then get strong within those ranges of motion and prevent whatever was causing you to get tight in the first place. Oftentimes muscles are tight because the body is sensing some kind of danger or weakness or instability. So it's keeping everything tight. And although you may be in chronic pain, it's actually preventing you from from getting a really bad injury. Well, it could be that way too, because it's overactive and it's being overused because it's overcompensating, like the point I was making yeah. earlier. And to right, that right. and to that point, you have to add, if you throw that in there, that static stretching is one of the best ways to relieve immediate pain. I would argue that uh, soft tissue work oh, and foam, foam rolling is right there totally, also. Totally. So, but it doesn't end there. I think that's one of the things I used to always have to teach clients is right. I teach something like uh, you know self myofascial release which, or the foam roll right to somebody and show them how to roll their IT or something that was causing, which is a common area, right? A lot of people um, pronate in their feet, their femurs internally rotate, which tightens up that fucking IT like crazy, and then they feel that pain all the way up from their hip or down by their like their knee or the front of their knee. And that's that IT that's all tight. And you can roll that and instantly, like right away, feel a difference. You spend five, 10 minutes rolling like your IT for a lot of people and instantly they can feel better. But that's not it. Like you can't just no. stop there and then go back and then get on a treadmill and run and then call it a day. It's like you're going to be constantly doing your, you're just putting a band aid over something. If you don't address the hip mobility and the ankle mobility, that yeah. you've just now relieved some of the pain right away, so you now can now go work on right. taking those joints full the, through the full range of motion and strengthening the muscles that support those joints. That's what's going to for long. You want to use it as a tool to unlock better movement patterns, right? And then start you know really building and forging uh, better movement patterns uh, by first you know kind of addressing that. Yes, this mm. is giving me pain. I can alleviate this pain. But then now working in towards a, a better uh, direction with this. Now I remember the first time. So for the listeners who don't know uh, what the IT was, it's it, it's there's a uh, there's a big fascia that runs along the side of your thigh, okay, and it starts up at the hip and it comes down. It kind of wraps around your shin, and if you have bad movement patterns, that fascia can start to feel tight and start to get tight, um, and the muscles that attach to it kind of get tight, and so then it further causes worse and worse uh, movement patterns. Now, I remember for me, the first time I got on a foam roller and with my legs straight and laid on the, the side of my thigh, which is the IT band, it was the most painful thing I'd ever experienced in my entire life. Now, when I did it the second and third time, it didn't hurt quite as much because things, you know, whatever the terminology you want to use, loosened up or whatever, um, we don't know quite what happens to tissue when we're pressing on it real hard. We just know that it actually does alleviate pain and tells the central nervous system to chill out a little bit, well, and then I'm, it lets you move better. I'm glad you went there too, though, because th this is a part that annoys me about our space is, you know, 
a lot of the, the experts like to debate over the terminology that we've used to explain a tool like that. Right. And what's happened is something that uh, that could be very useful for a lot of people is now disregarded because there's this debate and argument over the science of what's really happening there. At the end of the day, the relief that somebody can get by rolling instantly is incredibly beneficial, especially if you do your due diligence of the work afterwards. Totally. So, so uh, I'm... Excellent, excellent point because, yeah, we don't know what is really happening when we're doing deep tissue work. So like you go to a massage therapist, you have a, a knot in mm -hmm. your muscle. Is there really a knot there? I don't know. I mean, you yeah. can feel it, but if we looked at it, if we took that muscle off and looked at it in a laboratory, it would look no different than another muscle. Um, what's probably happening is that the your CNS, which is the controller, right? The CNS is what tells muscles to squeeze or or relax or stay it's tight. The overbearing so mother is what I call it. Yeah, so the CNS may be telling that muscle to kind of stay a little bit tense, and that's what feels like a knot. So then when you push on that knot, by adding pressure, that sends a signal to the CNS that says, hey, chill out a little bit. And then you feel the – And if, if for anybody who's ever had a massage, you know exactly what I'm talking about. All of a sudden you feel like, oh, that muscle's not tight anymore. It feels so much better. Yeah. Now, how does that help you – with mobility, okay, For first off, immediate pain relief. Yes, it feels good right away. But if we don't fix what caused it to get tight, you gotta go. you got to go back to the massage therapist every single week. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm taking somebody and I'm having them do uh, a cable row. So this is where you sit down, you grab the cable, and you pull it towards your, towards your midsection. And the goal of the cable row or proper form, part of it is to pull the shoulder blades back and down. Not let them shrug up near the, near the ears, but rather pull them back and down. But let's say I'm working with someone who's got really, really tight uh, neck muscles near the traps or the trap muscles. This is where the shoulder meets the neck, which a lot of people have, right? Let's say those muscles are really tight. That means that those muscles are kind of turned on a little bit. When I have that person do a row, what you'll find is that they'll shrug. They won't be able to pull their shoulders back really nicely. They'll shrug a little bit. So then what I'll do is as a trainer is I'll push on those muscles, get the CNS to relax a little bit. Then we go back to doing the row and now they have a better chance at doing the proper movement. And the proper movement is what prevents them from getting tight in the first place. This is the right way to use soft tissue work. Well, there's another, I have a personal story myself with this that was such a game changer is I had bursitis in my hips forever. And I always, I had the same experience as you did when I foam rolled my IT. Now, what I did poorly was I never followed the kinetic chain all the way down to my feet and re recognized that this was a breakdown from the feet that was running all the way up mm. into my hip. And what I had that's really common, and I've had to fix this in many people going forward because now I'm way more aware of it because of my personal experience, is when I would squat, my, my feet would pronate in. Well, the, the pronating in also rotates the femur so my thigh turns in a little bit which is twisting that it and then it's pulling on right where the hip where it runs into and then like an asshole i was competing and trying to look amazing so i was pushing the weight on the bar and squ continuing to squat heavy and so this is where this bursitis started to kick up and i would just unless i would just completely stop squatting or extra uh, doing leg stuff heavy i i couldn't eliminate this bursitis and it wasn't until I would roll it out to get the immediate relief. Then I would address what was going on in my feet and start to work on my feet staying stable and then work on better range of motion and deeper squats so my hips were getting more mobile from going deeper and long. That Now it's gone. Right. It's completely gone. I don't have to foam roll anymore because now I have a much better squat. My feet are planted on the ground like they're supposed to. I have way better depth. And so that pain has completely gone away just by me continuing to it's squat. It's important you pick up on that pain signal because right. if you don't – if you don't like address that fact that this is a this is a, this is a sign that something is off, and you're just gonna go through the the movement and try and improve the movement and the technique, and then load it accordingly, you're just gonna exacerbate the yeah. issue down the road. And so that's why it's important to listen, listen to your body, listen to these signs, signals of of pain. It's it's trying to help correct course what what, what you're programming. Yeah, this so the, the other day I went to go um, replace my screen door and I you know I'm trying to it's real it slides along the track and it's really doesn't slide very well and I'm looking at the track and the track is kind of it's like grind it up a little bit you know like because it's sliding on it not a hundred percent so it's grinding it up so we would change the, the track but then it would happen uh, over time it would happen again we'd have to change the track 
finally, I'm like, let's figure out the root cause of this. And so we had to look at the whole thing, and it just wasn't aligned properly. Mm -hmm. And so it was okay for a few months, but eventually, going back and forth on that track, the track continues to get ruined. So what mobility work does is it solves the root problem of your pain. And that's why that's the number one thing I would say, or the number one factor. But it's not the only thing that you can do to uh, help alleviate pain. And usually it does the job though, I'll be honest. Usually that, that alone will fix it. But I've had clients, and I did this for long enough, I'm sure you guys have too, where you do the mobility work, you do the correction, like, you're moving better, the pain is you know, 50% or 70% gone, right. but it's like still, still there. Still remains. Yeah, well, still there. What's the, going on? The next place I always go, because that's, I think, the, the number one, and that's why I'm glad we started that place. Uh, the next place I typically look into, if I'm not doing it at the same time, because, I mean, now as a trainer, you, you probably address, we've done this long enough that you, you know better, so you probably address all these points together. But if I'm still having problem, it, it's nine times out of 10, it's related to diet now. Yeah. Uh, now we we probably have, and a that's such a controversial thing to say, isn't uh, that funny? Yeah, it's so controversial th to say that diet could be causing your body, your joints uh, pain. Now I'm going to give you a very basic example that I think is more clear because we're going to start talking about diet, and it's going to be a little bit more vague, uh, maybe a little bit more on the fringe. Uh, although more and more health practitioners are are, are agreeing with this, um, but I'll give you one that's more uh, just more, much more clear. Now, years ago, I had a, a personal training facility, a studio, and in there I had other health practitioners and they all specialized in different things. I was the fitness person. So I did the exercise stuff. Back then I wasn't very well versed on anything else that had to do with, uh, with health besides working out and, you know, cutting calories and macros. So I wasn't, I didn't understand wellness very well. I didn't understand inflammation very well, meditation, anything like that. So I remember I had a client uh, he had back pain and I did all the mobility work. We worked on his flexibility. We did, I mean, we did this for a while. It was like six months. And after about six months, his pain was largely reduced, but it was still there a little bit. It was still kind of there. Now this client also had lost some weight, but he always had kind of had this kind of big belly. And I remember one of my staff members, I was having this conversation with him about his pain. And he was telling me, you know, ah, it's almost all gone, but it still bothers me here and there. And I'm like, well, you know, and you know, my my answer was, well, I think maybe we got it to the best it could get. We're going to continue working on mobility. Hopefully, it'll keep getting better. Well, anyway, my staff member heard overheard us talking, and he leaves, and she comes up to me. And she says, "You should talk to him about his diet." And I'm like, I rolled my eyes, like, what the hell's diet have to do with this? I mean, what? Well, sure, if he loses weight, you know, maybe that'll help. She goes, No, 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 it has to do with uh, the way he's activating his core. And I said, What? And he goes, look, she goes, his back, his pain is in his lower back. What supports the spine in the lower, the, in the lumbar region? I said, well, the, the core muscles do. She said, that's right. She goes, take a muscle and stretch it out. Is it strong or is it weak? I said, well, it's weak if it's really, really stretched out, right? So if you're listening right now, if someone takes your arm and stretches it to its furthest you know, ability, try and activate your muscles of your arm and try and apply some strength. You're weak. Your muscles are strongest in the mid-range of motion. When they're fully contracted or fully stretched, they're not quite as strong, especially when they're really, really stretched. You just lose connection and strength. So she said, his gut is constantly inflamed. You can see it in his belly. We, he, we would talk about his nutrition habits. She says, if his gut's inflamed, it's pushing out all the muscles of his midsection, of his core, and now those muscles can't activate and stabilize well enough. And it was like a light bulb went off him. I said, that's 100%. I bet you that's the issue. He comes in the next time. I talked to him again about his diet. I said, look, we don't need to cut calories. But there's definitely foods that cause digestive issues and bloating with you, right? And he goes, yeah. I said, let's cut those out and see what happens. Sure enough, digestion gets better. Bloating goes, bloating goes down. Less back pain. And, it, and I believe it had to do mostly with the fact that now he was able to activate those muscles a little better. This is why. We actually don't talk about this very often. But this is also another really cool benefit in a way that I used to use fasting with clients to prove this point, to show that to them. And that makes it easy. It makes my job easy too. Cause then I'm not, cause what's one of the hardest parts about going the direction that you're going, Sal is like, what food is causing yeah. the inflammatory signal? Yeah. What is, what is their body reacting to that's inflaming their body? That's now causing the joints to hurt even more. You find the needle in the haystack. So one of my favorite ways to, to show that that's the problem or that could be the problem that we're dealing with is throwing my client on a 24 to a 48 hour fast and no exercise and then getting the feedback of how mm -hmm. they feel. 
and you'll be blown away. This is you or you're somebody who this could be the problem. That's a great way to test that by fasting for 24 to 4 hours, not exercising during that time, and pay attention how you feel when you wake up totally. and how you when you walk around and you move around and you'll you'll see the people that are that that's the offender of why they're having a lot of chronic pain. It's normally greatly reduced or completely eliminated in a fasted state. Totally. Yeah, and, and I noticed too, and I, I love that because it what it does too is it promotes more hydration uh, along that process. And I've I've found because this kind of falls in the category of diet, uh, you know, making sure that my body's properly hydrated and, and lubricated in the joints, oftentimes that by itself tends to you know bode well for like lowering the pain signal as no, well. Totally. And by the way, this uh, if your if your infl- if your diet is causing you to be inflamed. Either through you know the systemic inflammation from eating foods that don't really agree with your body, because what happens when you eat a food that doesn't really work with you is you get this like mild immune reaction. You get this mild like your body mounts this offense, um, and it can feel like bloating, it could feel like indigestion, it could feel like bad skin or whatever, or just can feel like pain. But when this immune reaction is is mounted, inflammatory markers go up a little bit because these inflammatory markers are signalers to the body that say, hey. Let's be on guard. Nothing wrong with that process, by the way. The inflammatory process is a very important process in the body. But if it's promotes too far, growth. it does. It promotes muscle growth. It promotes healing. But too far in one direction, and you start to feel more pain. Now, here's how it's connected to bad mobility. You've got more systemic inflammation because of your poor diet. Now you're not moving optimally. The poor movement patterns now become your default movement patterns, right. which then cause more pain. And this is why these are both so intricately connected. Now, there are foods that even Western medicine has identified as uh, anti-inflammatory. A great example, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, people who eat more, uh, have a diet that's higher in omega-3 fatty acids, those are the ones you might get in fish, for example, um, sus- tend to show systemically less inflammation. Heavily processed foods have also loosely been connected to more inflammation. Now, it can either be from the foods themselves, or it can be from the fact that heavily processed foods tend to uh, make us overeat. And there's the other thing that causes inflammation, overeating. If you're always overeating and you're obese, you tend to have higher amounts of these inflammatory factors in your body. So so to give you an example, when you take an ibuprofen or an an anti-inflammatory pill and you feel less pain, let's say your knee hurts, and you take it, now your knee doesn't hurt as much. Did the ibuprofen travel to the knee and work just on your knee? No. No, it worked systemically. It's, so that's systemic inflammation, and that's what a poor diet can cause. It can cause higher amounts of uh, this kind of systemic inflammation. Well, you alluded to obesity, but I, I mean, it's just overeating, period. So you could be somebody who manages your weight relatively okay, or maybe you're only 15, 20 pounds away, but if you have a, a habit of binge- purge, binge, purge, binge, purge type of mentality the way you eat. Or restrict. Yeah, or restrict. I always say purge, sorry. <laughs> I know. That's a bad habit. It's like the third time I've said that. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know what I mean though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're if you're in the habit of where you overconsume and then you restrict, you overconsume and then you restrict, which how it's how a lot of people tend to eat is because they don't have a great relationship with food, you absolutely could be having these issues from your diet too. Just because you're not you know, o- obese does not mean that the the uh, the overconsumption in a day or two could not be making some of this uh, worse for you. And then for people listening right now who are like, eh, I don't think diet's making me my back hurt or making my knees hurt. Look, here's a good example. You ever been hung over? Okay. Do you, does your body oh, hurt yeah. more? Of course it does. Food definitely plays a role in your overall pain, which then can play a role in how you move, which then can cause poor mobility. The reverse can also be true. If you have pain because of poor mobility, you could be trying to, you know, self-medicate with food that makes you temporarily feel better, like, you know, cupcakes or whatever, which then can cause more inflammation, which then can cause a poor mobility, and it becomes this kind of vicious cycle. So diet definitely should be uh, the second, uh, you know, most important way that you can reduce uh, pain on your body. Now, the third one, and this is another one that I didn't learn until much later, um, but this is an obvious one, um, poor sleep. Studies show conclusively that people who are even mildly sleep deprived perceive much higher amounts of pain. Now, this is also true for your heat heat and cold tolerance. If you're really tired, you might find that your body gets cold easily 
or you can't tolerate the heat as much. You may also find that you can't tolerate your friends as much or people around you as much. <laughs> you got a bit of short short fuse. Yeah, your body overall, um, you know, is just uh, higher. Uh, it's more inflamed, and then studies also show that they show that inflammatory markers go up when you have bad sleep. Well, it, you know, it's funny you brought this one up. Is that this also feeds back into the food thing too? I just had this experience the other the other night or the other uh, day. I had really bad sleep. I mean, I was exhausted. Um, uh, I probably got two hours of sleep one night. Uh, was up all night. My brain wouldn't stop. Had an early morning, then a long day. And man, I had these crazy cravings for just not Garbage. ideal. Garbage. Yeah, bad food. Yeah. You know, and it was. I was like, where is that coming from? And then I thought to myself, oh fuck, you know what? I bet it has something to do with my poor sleep. So. It's funny as we're moving down this list, and it was I mean, it wasn't like we ordered them like this, but you talking about this just reminded me of that. That you know that feeds into that. You know now you didn't sleep very well, and now you start to lean towards these processed foods or foods that are high inflammatory foods, which then affects the chronic pain, which then affects the mobility. So they're all connected to each other. Stu- too. Stu- studies are pretty good at showing that too. They show that sleep deprivation, people just they tend to become more impulsive with their choices. Yeah. These are all different spirals that if you don't address it, it's just going to get worse yeah. and worse and worse. Now, now, here's the thing with sleep. Sleep is uh, alone. If you're if you're not getting good quality sleep, if your sleep is below optimal levels for yourself, um, optimizing your sleep makes a tremendous difference. Now, if you're getting great sleep right now, you've get the, the right amount of time, you know, and it's good quality, um, then then good for you. But if you're like most people, because this is a lot of people, most people. Um, optimizing your sleep will make a huge, huge, huge difference in every aspect of your life, but definitely in terms of pain. Now, a lot of times people say, well, how can I optimize my sleep? Like, I feel like I I go to bed and I just crash out. I think I'm sleeping good or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. How much time do you put into optimizing your sleep? Or or I I should say, how much uh, value or respect do you give it? Do you just work and watch TV and then just jump in bed and expect yourself does this fall asleep and have great sleep? Or do you treat it like uh, a lot of fitness enthusiasts train, treat their workouts? It's so funny. It's like for the workouts, they'll get the right clothes. They'll yeah. get the right pre-workout, do the stretching, the warming up. They, headband. They, they know their workout ahead of time. They visualize it. You know, there's like the 30-minute process before they actually do the workout. But then when it comes to sleep, it's like they just expect to turn off the computer, put their head on the pillow, and boom, they're in this amazing slumber. Try this. Try a sleep routine. This is something that I implemented myself uh, not that long ago that's had a tremendous impact on my personal, personally on my sleep. And I thought I always had good sleep, but I didn't realize how bad it was until I started doing this. You got a cool nighty. Yeah. <laughs> About two hours before I want to go to bed, um, I either turn off the electronics in the house or I wear uh, blue light blocking uh, glasses. And there's a lot of different brands out there for blue light blocking glasses. We work with one called uh, Felix Ray, but- all, any glasses that block blue light uh, will actually do the job. And what it does is it tells the brain, okay, it's uh, it's nighttime. Or at least, at the very least, it doesn't think that it's as bright uh, of yeah. a sun as it does when you're not wearing blue light blocking glasses. Well, the glasses. closer you can get to that circadian rhythms where the sun comes up, the sun comes down, like that's going to be the most optimal for you. Right. And so you do that about an hour or two before bed, your brain's getting ready. And studies show that you produce more melatonin, which is the sleep hormone and you get better quality sleep. There's another part to this, by the way. Um, besides the sleep routine, getting sunlight during the day uh, has been 100% connected to getting better sleep at night, which is funny because uh, you know every every single time I've ever been in the sun all day long, I always get- Oh, I get fen- exhausted. Yeah, eat phenomenal sleep. But I don't even have to do anything. It's not no, like I, yeah. I'm not even running. You just or crash out like yeah, immediately. I'm just, I'm just getting sunlight, and it's because it sets that circadian rhythm. This is one of those things that I think that a lot of, uh, I, I feel like if you're in your 20s, this kind of goes in one year and out the other year. Totally. Because uh, you're already doing all that. I mean, like you're outside a lot more. Yeah, and you just, you know, at that- I you mean, get away with I it. You get a, away with a lot more. I had a yeah. mantra when I was in my early 20s that was- Probably the same one I had. Yeah, you know, sw- sleep is overrated or I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, <laughs> sleep is for pussies. I said all that shit. I did, I did. I said all of that stuff because, you know, up until that point, uh, my experience in life was- I was fine. I still went to work. I crushed work. I still worked out. I still could be fit. And so, you know, I didn't care what people were talking about sleep and the studies and the books that were being written about this. This didn't impact me. I didn't give a shit about it. And so I moved along. And then life happens. You know, you get a little bit older and then you start to notice things. Or I, maybe I just become more in tune with my body and notice these things. I've been doing this for a very long time now and start to pay attention to it. And it's probably more so that, that 
now in life, like I've, I'm really more in tune with my body speaking to me, you know, letting me know when things hurt or no, like just like I was mentioning, you know, I noticed I had poor sleep and right away my brain starts going like, how is this affecting me? Mm -hmm. One of the things I noticed right away was the cravings of the food that I had. So I'm just more aware of that. And I think when you're younger, you kind of ignore a lot of these signals that are being already sent to you. You just didn't give a shit about them. And you start noticing that I can't stress how important the sleep routine is. And I love that you compared it to the getting ready for the workout because we all tend, or even getting ready for your day. Like everybody showers, brush their teeth, puts their clothes on, thinks, you know, set, looks at the, opens their calendar, looks at base camp, like figures out maps. Out. Like we put all this energy into mapping out. And the irony is there's enough research and studies out there to show the importance of sleep that arguably it's the most important yeah. part of our day when it comes to now, recovery, mm -hmm. building muscle, hormones, all these things. And it's like, how funny is that, that there's just not a lot of conversation around that because we're we're asleep, so it's boring, it's not fun to talk about. Well, like 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 a lot of things in modern life, we have to to come up with a routine and structure. So you, you think to yourself, well, you know, humans, when did they have a sleep routine? Like, what? Well, yeah, that's because we were outside and the sleep routine was the sun. The sun was up, and then when it was up, we were up, and when it went down, you know, here's the thing about humans. We don't have good night vision, and here's the other thing. A lot of predators do, so it's 100% pretty sure that, you know, uh, ancient humans weren't, like, up all night doing work on computers. When sun went down, they're, like, go in the cave, and then they probably would, you know, go to sleep, have some sex, go to sleep or whatever. Mm. Well, now we got electric lights, so it's dark outside, bright in the house, your brain is perceiving that as the sun being up. It's not getting prepared for sleep. So the routine is as silly as it sounds. Try it out. Just try it out and watch, give it about a week and watch what happens. And when it comes to pain, the studies are conclusive. Lack of sleep causes higher amounts of pain. In fact, even if you don't have chronic pain, when you're sleep deprived, you may actually find that your body is achy and it hurts anyway. Now, you, you love talking about evolution all the time and bringing up points like that. Do you uh, do you think too that this is something that's getting worse every every day or every year that goes by that we continue to evolve our technology? Like you think about the the, the TV lights now. Like part of the advertising is how bright the LED yeah, is, and that it's putting like and just ten years ago you would not have been laying. I, ten years ago I would not ever ca caught myself doing this bad habit that I catch myself doing all the time, which is having my phone right by my bed and picking it up because of a notification yeah. from, you know, email, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, you know, that I, and I look at it and I'm pitch black in my room. I grab my phone and now I'm staring at this bright screen. Do you think that this is getting worse and worse as time goes on? And that's maybe why we're hearing more conversation like this, or you're seeing brands like Felix Gray that are coming out of nowhere and really blowing up because they're truly making a huge impact. I think people, on people are aware now. Cause I remember when I was a kid, um, it's so funny, like, you know, mom wisdom, you got to listen to your moms. I tell you what, I remember my mom used to be like, don't stand too close to the TV. Don't stare too close. It'll ruin your eyes. And then I remember getting a little older and reading some science articles. And they're like, oh, that's a myth. And I tell my mom, oh, that's a myth. Yeah. I have hairy palms. So. Yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> just, you know, that, one, that one thankfully is a myth. Yeah. Like, yeah, that was it a myth. Mom. Okay. Yeah, whatever. You know. And then you start, that's because they didn't know the impact of blue light on the eyes. Yeah. Now we're starting to learn. And I think you're going to start to see a reversal. I think you're going to start to see kids are going to probably be required to wear blue light blocking glasses while they're looking at computer screens in schools and people are now realizing its impact on sleep. And then we're also starting to realize the impact poor sleep has just on our overall health. It's actually a carcinogen. Yeah. People who have uh, like swing shifts or whatever, they've actually labeled that as a carcinogen like uh, like anything else, like smoking cigarettes, for example. That's, crazy. That's how bad of an effect it has. Now, the next one that goes close to it, and I kind of mentioned it earlier when we were talking about sleep, is sunlight. Uh, sunlight, and it's so funny, you know, a long time ago, one of the prescriptions for pain was to go out in the sun. That was also mm -hmm. the prescription for illness. Oh, is that true? Yeah. I absolutely. didn't know that. Well, absolutely. I know talking to my wife as a, uh, you know, pediatric nurse forever, and like they were always taking their patients out to get outside in the sun as much as possible be just because of that that fact. Oh, it made them feel better. Their moods were elevated, all kinds of benefits. Well, I do notice that. I mean, Rachel and I were literally just talking about this yesterday, and, you know, she went out. She was like, I got to go get out for a walk. And, where she was like, you know, can we talk about getting like a, a picnic bench outside or doing yeah. some, do some like, walking meetings? And I'm like, yeah, yeah no, you're, we're all on the same page because this is new to me. Uh, I've never worked in a fucking dungeon like we are now and had days where I could be in here all day long. 
And I feel it. I feel after about four or five hours when we're in here and we're got under fluorescent totally. light that I, I can feel like I feel lethargic. I feel tired. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard for me to motivate to get, get my workout. If I go outside, literally, and just walk for 15 minutes outside, in the, and especially on a nice sunny day here, instantly I can feel this dramatic mm-hmm. shift the other direction. It's like I just, it's, it almost feels like I took a pre workout shake or something, that that's how much I was being suppressed from being in here under fluorescent lights all, all afternoon and sitting on that and not getting sunlight and then all of a sudden getting sunlight. Oh, it's this amazing. is why I have my sunroof open all the time, even if it's uh, yeah. you know, cloudy, whatever. I mean, I don't open the window part, but I open the shade part so the sun comes through. Because we're always, you know, stuck in here. There's a couple things that we can say about sunlight. Obviously, the vitamin D part. Now, some health practitioners will say that vitamin D deficiency is chronic in modern societies. I would agree. I would say it's probably low in most people from all the articles that I've seen. Now, low vitamin D, it's well established, um, is uh, will cause pain, bone pain, and muscle pain. That's what's called. Co- that's actually one of the common signs. I actually didn't know that of low vitamin D is these is increased inflammation, but definitely bone pain. Because remember, vitamin D is important for bone Mm -hmm. health. But muscle pain as well. Um, There's some studies that show the knots that people get and the tension that people get um, increases quite uh, high when people are low in vitamin D. So sunlight obviously gives you vitamin D. If you have an office job and you're not out in the sun, uh, that could be one of the issues. Go out there and get some sun. Now, besides that, studies actually show that Sunlight, independent of the vitamin D boosting effects, has pain relieving effects. There's actually many studies you can look them up, but they find that going out in the sun increases things like nitric oxide. Uh, vaso, there's vasodilations of the blood vessels, so it improves your heart health, uh, improves your, uh, it, it mobilizes killer T cells, so it's got some, you know, benefits for immune system. And then there's these other studies that are that where people go outside and they just generally feel less pain. Now maybe. Uh, from the physiology changing in your body from the sunshine, it's psychological, or too. it may be your mood. Yeah, right. you know that's a big one. Like just you, how your mood is also dictates. Well, we talk all the time about the import how you perceive pain, and we yeah. we talked we had an episode not that long ago. We we're talking about the you know the monks that have trained to perceive pain differently, and just the it's another the, big big component, right? Just think of the positive effects of going out and seeing how how often do you hear this? The sky is clear and it's a sunny day, and you go, oh, it's so beautiful out. Totally. Like, say that without smiling, right? How many people right. do that? And that just that that pattern of like oh having a positive attitude about it, I would think. That in itself would make a difference in the pain. Well, mindfulness is uh, would be the last thing that I would say. And, and mindfulness, and this is a tough one. That's why it's last. Because you try telling someone that their pain is right. not physical. In the sense that uh, it, the pain is physical, but the cause is not physical. You try telling someone that. Very, very difficult discussion to be had. It's very, very hard to, to even comprehend. But it's very true. Uh, sadness, depression, trauma... We can feel it as physical pain. Now, those are the extreme cases, but if you have chronic pain that is causing a decline in your quality of your life, sometimes mindfulness practices like meditation, prayer, or a spiritual practice, Mm -hmm. by the way, I'm not making this up, look it up, there's many studies that support this, people will actually start to feel less pain. Now, maybe that the pain itself is gone because it was manifested from their mind, Mm -hmm. or maybe that the pain's still there, they just perceive it, as much less. Mm-hmm. And there's studies on monks where they do this, where they, they they do these tests where they'll take them through different, you know, pain parameters or whatever, and they'll find that they feel their body's registering the pain just as much as a normal person. They just don't perceive it uh, nearly as bad. It is such a hard concept to wrap, you know, your brain around. I've had clients that have had still had had issues with with pain, but have done all the work and have gone to all these different levels and lengths to to alleviate it, but uh, have gone to like body workers and you know therapists, and they've found a lot of that was stemming from you know psychological issues. Oh, that dude, they're carrying I, in their body, dude. I had uh, you know I've had clients who I had one client who hurt uh, his shoulder. Um, and it really, really um, had a, a detrimental effect on his quality of life because um, he was a very active uh, individual. So he came to work with me. We worked on the mobility of the shoulder, did it for a long time. He was very, very diligent. And his mobility became excellent. Like for all intents and purposes, I would watch his shoulder move and everything. And I even had my physical therapist on staff look at it. And, you know, we both agreed like, ah, the kind of pain that he's feeling shouldn't be coming from the physical component. I mean, he's, yeah, he had images done and everything. We couldn't figure out what was going on. So finally I had this conversation. And luckily he's a very open-minded person. I said, 
Do you think maybe that your 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 body's holding on to this pain because it was such a traumatic experience for you? Mm. And so he started doing this mindfulness practice and he said there was now he did this for like a month or two. There was a moment where the pain literally went away. He was thinking about it, being mindful, and the pain gone. And then it didn't come back. And it was so crazy for someone to experience that that I trained. Well, didn't we didn't you talk about a study a couple of years ago that came out when we were in the begin in the middle of podcasting? It was definitely after uh, that talked about how they now have science to prove that memories are stored in muscle. Oh well, the fascia. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, it's funny that we need studies for this, but um, you know, picture in your mind a depressed uh, young lady. Uh, she has a depressed looking posture, doesn't she? She's got her shoulders rolled forward, head down a little bit. Um, can can her depression show up in her body? Yes. Now think of someone who's happy, someone who's confident, someone who's scared. Those all reflect in postures. So yes, it definitely shows up in the body. Now it may be subtle. You might not obviously see it. Someone's stress might not like obviously show, but do you think that in subtle ways their muscles are are, are, are holding those memories or protecting their body from whatever they are feeling. And then that could cause mobility issues, which then can cause problems. Absolutely. And then of course there's studies that show that antidepressants, there's people with, uh, there was several studies I read where people had uh, back pain that they could not diagnose. They did MRIs and imaging and, you know, you know, you know movement specialists, and they just couldn't figure out why the hell these people's backs hurt. Then they put them on antidepressants and the back pain was gone. gone. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. People who are depressed, in fact, do uh, clinically show uh, more pain in their bodies. Then there's the studies where where they had people with knee pain, where uh, they they operated on half of them, the other half of them, they just cut the cut the knee open, sewed it back up, did no surgery. And the people who had the fake surgery had just as much pain relief as the people who had the real surgery. Right. So don't knock the mindfulness part. It's definitely a very, very important component um, it's just one of the more difficult ones, I would say, to explain to people, right? I mean, Absolutely. don't it, isn't it really just the practice and and the skill and ability to reframe every situation, make friends with it, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, I feel like it's the same thing that when uh, I talk to people about you know, overcoming fear or how I dealt with certain things in my life, and you know, I really think that it just it trained me to have this skill to look and reframe the situation, like. You know, it's, uh, that, what's that saying? There's no such thing as uh, big problems, only problems that we make big. Mm -hmm. And so it's that ability. And I think that's when you're, you know, learning to meditate, learning to be uh, mindful of situations. What you're really learning to do is to look at it and just reframe it differently. Like you, you, you get hurt somewhere and, it, and it, it was painful. It was an injury. It is. But learning to have a different attitude about it really makes a huge difference on how your body will then perceive it. And that practice of meditation and mindfulness, that's what you're, it's really like, that's the practice and game time mm -hmm. is when you get hurt. Yes. Right? I'm practicing every day to be kind of more mindful, to meditate on these things, reframe all my daily stuff, have gratitude, all those things. And then those moments come where now you're challenged and that's where all that practice yeah. you comes know how to in. to navigate through right. it. Right. That's where all that practice comes in is that I've been practicing this this skill to be more mindful, to meditate, to to not react right away, to learn how to reframe things for those moments in life that happen when injury occurs or shit happens. Now I have the tools in my tool belt to be able to reframe the situation. Totally. And mindfulness, I would say, is the most important for the kind of pain that you just can't seem to figure out with everything else. You know, the kind of pain where you're just like, man, I've done the mobility, I've done diet, sleep, I'm doing everything. And, you know, I've, I've made some dents in it, but it's still there. You know, um, the mindfulness piece, that's the piece that then starts to make a big impact. And by the way, I'm not speaking, you know, just out of the air. I've read lots of literature on this. And the studies show that it actually, and that's why I would say it's one of the more important components. So if you listen to this episode and you follow some of these things and kind of maybe even follow them. Uh, in order, I think we name them pretty much in the order that we think uh, they are in terms of importance. Yep. Um, I think many of you listening will be solving a lot of your pain uh, issues. Um, now, we have free resources. If you want to read more information from Mind Pump, just go to mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. You can find us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.